Okay, may I call the room in order? I'm a military officer. My name is Pan Zhen Chia, and therefore I must be very strict to observe time. Another reason is、uh, we cannot afford to to waste the time. We only have one hour and a half at our disposal, so we must make the best use of our time. And therefore, I declare that we will start our session. <laughs> This session is、uh, supposed to focus on North East Asia security. And、uh, on the list of the members of our panel, we have four speakers、uh, coming from、uh, countries of this region. We also have one commentator from the United States. He、uh, will be coming pretty soon.、Uh, I just want to make a very brief introduction to you about our speakers. The first speaker is our ambassador,、uh, Gleb Ivashetov, who is a former ambassador to South Korea. And the second one is、uh, Zhao Tong, Mr. Zhao Tong, from China.、Uh, he is、uh, a fellow of Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. Which is based in Beijing. The third one is、uh, Professor Seiji Eno. He's a professor of international politics at、uh, Seikei University at Tokyo. The last but not least speaker is、uh, Mr. Mark Su. And perhaps I should speak a little more, a few more words about the Mark. He resides at Berlin, but he works for、uh, Park Wash at、uh, for South Korea. He is a unique person, in fact, to play a bridging role between North Korea and the outside world. Even at the most difficult times, the contact of him with、uh, North Korea has never been interrupted. So he really has a unique knowledge about North Korea, quite different from the views from others. But anyway, I suppose that these four gentlemen have adequate expertise to talk on North East、uh, East Asia security issues, particularly North Korea. Security issues. Unfortunately, we do not have presentation from North Korea itself, so that's a pity.、Uh, but the Park West has tried the very best, try to induce these people to come. So hopefully, next round of the discussion, we might see、uh, the representatives from North Korea. Without further ado. I would like to invite、uh, our speakers to take the floor, but I have already warned our speakers that they should talk just about the ten minutes to highlight their major point they think important to share with us,、uh, and and that way I hope that you will have just about. Half an hour after their presentations, for a kind of interaction between the panel and the audience, so there will be, I hope, that there will be a live interaction between us. Without further ado, you may ask、uh, first of all the Russian ambassador to speak first. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Those who play chess know of the situation called Tsukzwang, wherein players are put in a disadvantage because they must make a move when they would prefer to pass and not move. 
The fact that the players are compelled to move means their position will become significantly weaker. It is likely that a similar situation is developing around Korea. The DPRK missile and nuclear program has entered a new stage. It seems Pyongyang is going to acquire a full-scale potential to survive the first strike and to respond, causing an unacceptable damage to a potential adversary like the United States. In this situation, General Joseph Dunford, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States Armed Forces, said recently that war between the United States and the North Korea is not unimaginable, adding that anyone who's been alive since the Second World War well, has never seen the loss of life that could occur if there is a conflict on the Korean Peninsula. The senior officer of the United States Armed Forces knew what he was talking about. The possibility of a military operation against the DPRK was discussed in Washington from the early 1990s as soon as Pyongyang's nuclear program began. According to forecasts submitted in 1994 to President Bill Clinton by the then commander of the United Forces in South Korea, General Gary Luck, the total losses of the United States and South Korea could reach almost a million troops, including up to 100,000 killed Americans. The total cost of war with the DPRK was estimated at $100 billion, and the amount of economic damage to South Korea, more than $1 trillion. Such losses were considered unacceptable for the Clinton administration, and it decided to negotiate with Pyongyang. Today, even pinpoint strikes on North Korean nuclear missile sites would lead to even more severe consequences. Just an example. On the border of the demilitarized zone, which separates the two Korean states, there is South Korean Greater Seoul, a city of about 25 million people. On the opposite side of the DMZ, there is the world's most powerful concentration of the North Korean heavy artillery. The artillery shelling of Seoul by the North Koreans is capable of inflicting damage to the South Korean capital comparable to the use of nuclear weapons. It is quite clear that such a strike by Pyongyang would be followed with a mighty strike from the South Korean side, which would result in a new Korean war. The DPRK is not the only state that develops its military nuclear program bypassing the non-proliferation treaty. One may refer to the relevant programs of India and Pakistan, which openly carried out their nuclear tests some 20 years back as well as of Israel, which neither confirmed nor disproved its possessing nuclear weapons. However, none of these states was subjected to a wave of such negative emotions and sanctions like the DPRK. Some international experts explain the situation by the fact that India, Pakistan and Israel never joined the NPT, while the DPRK used to be a party to the treaty but withdrew from it, thus offending the cardinal norm of international law, this pacta sunt servanda. Uh, existing treaties must be implemented in good faith. But didn't other states offend that norm? The United States, for instance, has withdrawn from the ABM treaty, which was no less important for the international security than the NPT. Surely, there are those who proceed from the premise that all states are equal, but some states are more equal than others, if to paraphrase the formulation of George Orwell's characters. It is significant that when Pyongyang threatens its potential enemies with nuclear missile strikes, in each case, it is only about response strikes to external aggression against the DPRK. By the way, some sober heads in the United States noted this. For example, William Perry, the United States Secretary of Defense in the Bill Clinton administration, wrote, 
I quote, the North Korean leadership is not suicidal. They are not seeking martyrdom. They want to stay in power, and they understand that if they launch a nuclear attack, this country will be destroyed, and they themselves will be killed. It would end the Kim dynasty. Their nuclear arsenal does give them a tenuous hold on power, but only if they do not use it." End of quotation. For Pyongyang, the nuclear missile program is a shield for its security, and it will not simply give it up. The North Korean leadership knows how the West thanked Libyan leader Gaddafi for a voluntary renunciation of the nuclear program and doesn't want to repeat his fate. The alternative to a new Korean war lies on the path of talks with Pyongyang to agree specifically, honestly, and transparently about security guarantees. First and foremost for the DPRK and the Republic of Korea, as well as for Russia and China, Japan and the United States. Such guarantees should be durable and convincing enough that no one had any suspicion about them. The further pressing on Pyongyang would just increase the threat of the conflict. It is not important, for instance, on whose side the computer would fail in the time of the United States-South Korean joint military drills, which Pyongyang considers as provocative rehearsals of invasion. The ways leading to settlement of the nuclear problem of Korea are not closed. As a starting point for political negotiations, one could use the March proposal by the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi that the DPRK suspends its missile launches and the development of the nuclear program in exchange for the suspension of military exercises by the United States and South Korea. This proposal may be well accepted by Pyongyang, by, by Pyongyang. Similar ideas were already voiced earlier by the North Korean leadership in January 2015 and January 2016. There is one other very important aspect of the situation. The Korean Peninsula nuclear issue is a direct produce of the failure to address the so-called Korean question which predicted the multi-annual confrontation between two Korean states. Therefore, the settlement is inseparable from normalizing the inter-Korean relations. Two tasks need to be addressed in tandem, namely freezing and subsequently dismantling North Korea's nuclear weapons program, along with diffusing political tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Wrong are those who rely on the spontaneous collapse of the North Korean regime. That regime had repeatedly proved a considerable margin of safety. Political stability is there, while, no, while the economic situation in North Korea has even improved in recent years. The DPRK is a member of the United Nations and of other international organizations. It is recognized by more than 160 countries of the world and should not be talked to, and should be talked to, not shouted at with loudspeakers. The United Nations security uh, resolutions are tough. However, there should be no unfoundedly broad interpretation of the stipulated sanctions. The resolutions should not be viewed as a ground to aggravate economic and humanitarian situation of the people of the DPRK. 64 years since the end of the Korean War have demonstrated that the Korean problem cannot be resolved by war, regardless of whom the rivals ask for support. And one can only welcome the line of the new South Korean President Moon Jae-in on a direct dialogue with Pyongyang and face solution of the nuclear missile program issue. The return of the Korean issue to the United Nations agenda can play a positive role as well. Now it is the right time for that. Ban Ki-moon, who was of South Korea, could not be impartial in his approaches to the DPRK. And Pyongyang ignored him emphatically. His successor, 
Antonio Guterres was not previously associated with Korea and therefore can show a fairly objective and constructive approach to the matter of the inter-Korean settlement. A United Nations conference on the Korean Peninsula could cover a variety of topics like achieving peace, establishing diplomatic ties of North Korea with South Korea, the United States and Japan respectively. The conference could bring together the United Nations Secretary General, the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, the Republic of Korea and the DPRK, as well as possibly some other states on mutual agreement of both Korean states. Obviously, that idea would not be immediately be accepted. But the proposal to conduct six-party talks was not immediately accepted either. The peace treaty, that is to eventually replace the 1953 Korean Armistice Agreement, should be more than just a non-aggression pact between the parties to the Korean War. It should be a much more ambitious partnership document that would turn North Korea into a full participant in international relations. Both the Koreas are to be parties to that peace treaty, while the United Nations Security Council, five permanent members, could act as guarantors for the parties to adhere to their commitments. The international security issues can't settle by themselves. All the interested parties should take efforts not to allow the developments around Korea to come to a Tsukswang. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador, for your excellent presentation on North Korea, which highlights the complexity of the issue. And I also thank you for your your way, you know, for try to, uh, what's the way to, uh, to resolve this issue? Uh, I'd like now to invite uh, uh, Dr. Zhao Tong for, for his presentation. Again, just about the 10 minutes. Thank you, General Pan. I think today most of us would agree that uh, the risk of war over the Korea Peninsula is unprecedentedly high. I think this failure to contain North Korea's nuclear crisis so far is in part a result of North Korean persistence in pursuing its nuclear weapons, but it is also a result of the lack of coordinated efforts from the international community and especially from the countries in this region, in the Northeast Asian region, in dealing with North Korea. I think the reason for the lack of coordinated efforts is the existence of deep divergence of views among regional countries over a number of key issues regarding North Korea. I will mention four examples because I believe the best way to promote cooperation is to firstly identify the differences and where the differences come from. First, I think there are very divergent views about economic sanctions. The current approach of imposing sanctions is not working well because we still cannot answer a basic question. Should we, the international community, directly threaten the stability of the role of the North Korean government? China believes that it is not wise to do so. And even the United States seems to agree that trying to overthrow the regime would be a very risky option that involves too many uncontrollable variables to guarantee a desirable outcome. As a result, senior American officials have repeatedly stated that Washington only seeks policy change, not regime change. The dilemma, however, is for economic sanctions to be effective, they must be sufficiently tough and comprehensive to directly threaten the stability of the North Korean regime. 
only something like a comprehensive economic embargo that completely cuts off the economic lifeline of North Korea from the outside world would force Pyongyang to recalculate that maybe keeping their nuclear weapons actually makes them less secure. Anything short of that will further enrage North Korea, but will have little chance of denuclearizing it. For China, this shows the inherent limitation of what sanctions can achieve. In fact, the American practice of pressing China to do more without being able to explain the logic and the objectives behind imposing additional sanctions makes Beijing believe that the White House doesn't really have a coherent strategy towards North Korea and that the White House is simply refusing to consider more practical but difficult options such as a negotiated agreement with North Korea. And this makes China less willing to do more in terms of imposing sanctions. Second, there are very divergent views about the North Korean motivations. A key difference of views among regional countries is over their beliefs about what North Korea seeks to achieve with nuclear weapons and whether it can be deterred from using them. China believes North Korea's nuclear program is to safeguard the regime's survival. Its leaders have no interest in starting a suicidal nuclear war and can be deterred from using its nuclear weapons for aggressive purposes. As a result, China is more willing to consider the option of allowing North Korea to keep its existing nuclear capabilities for now while negotiating a step-by-step -step agreement to gradually denuclearize it in the long run. But many American experts believe North Korea will try to threaten nuclear use coercively for more offensive objectives, including by attempting to drive American troops out of South Korea and forcing South Korea into reunification on North Korean terms. As a result, Washington is less interested in considering more practical near-term agreements such as capping and freezing North Korea's capabilities. Third, there are very divergent views about the North Korean sincerity in suspending its nuclear and MISA tests. Over the last couple of years, Pyongyang has repeatedly proposed to suspend its nuclear and missile tests in return for the United States and South Korea to restrain their joint military exercises. China and the United States seem to disagree about North Korea's interests and sincerity in suspending such tests. Beijing seems to believe that Pyongyang has the true, Pyongyang has the true interest in making and implementing such a near-term agreement. Part of the reason is China itself, for decades, had relied on no more than two dozens of silo-based liquid-fueled ICBMs to deter the United States. This small and vulnerable ICBM force might not be absolutely survivable, but it still made a credible deterrent because as long as one's enemy cannot be 100% sure that it can preemptively and completely destroy one's entire nuclear force, that nuclear force constitutes a credible deterrent. It does not have to be 100% survivable and reliable. In other words, North Korea can continue building a better, larger, more advanced, and a more reliable nuclear missile arsenal, but technically speaking, it does not have to do so. Therefore, China seems optimistic that North Korea can accept a freeze agreement, whereas Washington, by and large, dismisses North Koreans' seriousness in proposing such a quid pro quo. This divergence of views explains why China has made so much effort to promote the so-called suspension for suspension negotiation strategy 
but the United States has given China a very cold shoulder. Fourth, the fourth point is about the prospect of a grand bargain that can fundamentally resolve the North Korean nuclear issue. The grand bargain is North Korea will denuclearize in return for the normalization of relations with the United States and for the international community to embrace the return of North Korea as a normal member of them. My personal view is the grand bargain at this moment probably won't work, given how paranoid North Korea is and given the deep distrust towards the United States. Any grand bargain with North Korea will be asymmetric in nature in terms of the commitments. The American commitment in such a bargain to not threaten North Korea is essentially a political commitment which can be reversed overnight. The North Korean commitment to denuclearization will entail substantive changes to its material capability, something irreversible. And given the deep mistrust, I think the reason why previous similar agreements have failed was partially that North Korea kept having problems with trusting such an asymmetric bargain. In recent years, given that North Korean distrust towards the United States has only increased rather than decreased, there is little chance North Korea will accept a similar deal now. This means if we insist on North Korea committing to denuclearization at the beginning of a dialogue, we most likely will go nowhere. The only hope is if we can start a process of talking to North Korea and agreeing to jointly take some initial steps to defuse tensions and freeze the program, some mutual confidence may be built, which will then pave the way for more radical measures towards rolling back the existing capabilities. A key divergent point among regional countries is whether we believe North Korea is willing and capable of gradually reforming and reintegrating into international community. Most American experts are very skeptical. Many Chinese still have hope. But how about North Korea? I think the North Korean leaders themselves don't know. They may have recognized that to sustain the economic development and their role, they ultimately have to reform and gradually reintegrate. If this is to happen for them, it has to be an incremental and well-managed process because any sudden inflow of outside information and influence could threaten them. But if this happens gradually over a long time, they can adapt and remain safe. At this moment, it is very difficult even for them themselves to predict whether this will succeed in the long run in terms of regime survival and how this might ultimately play out. But the key for regional countries and for the international community is we should not make it more difficult for North Korea to decide to reform and, and open up. Instead, we should create conditions and an environment that encourage that decision. But now we are really taking mutually conflicting measures. For example, China and Russia want to encourage North Korea to reform. Just, well, conclude. Mr. Chao, you have only one okay. minute to finish for, up. For now, China and Russia, are working to encourage North Korea to reform and open up, but some others embrace policies such as inciting defectors and using propaganda warfare to incite social instability. These only work to convince the North Korean leaders that reforming and opening up is simply a dead end. By adopting travel bans to North Korea, by prohibiting North Korean people from working in foreign countries, by launching an international campaign to completely isolate North Korea, we are blocking the North Korean leaders from finding a way out. In conclusion, these are only some examples of the major differences of views among regional countries about North Korea and about how to deal with North Korea. If we want to achieve real and long-term cooperation in addressing the North Korean nuclear threat, we need to start substantive dialogues among ourselves to bridge the gap on these basic but critically important issues. Otherwise, we run a growing risk of combating each other rather than the common threat we all face. But even more importantly, just in one second, the cause of the different views among ourselves is we don't truly understand North Korea and we cannot convince each other about who is more right about North Korea. So part of the solution can be said in one sentence. 
if we, we cannot deal with the North Koreans if we do not understand them, and we will never understand them if we do not talk to them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zhao. It's a good presentation, except that you used more than we wish you used. Again, I just want to remind our other speakers that uh, we cannot afford to have a long presentation. We need more time for our interaction among us. And therefore, ideally, 10 minutes will be the best. Just to highlight your major point, don't elaborate. Now, uh, Professor, thank you. Thank you, General Pam. Uh, I try to be brief. Um, it looks that the current leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, is very determined to go nuclear, to have its own nuclear deterrent, which to me is quite unwise and irresponsible. Uh, but looked from his own perspective, or looked from the existing theory of the international politics, DPLK's behavior could be interpreted as rational or, and wise. Uh, we could charge against the DPLK uh, and denounce it harshly, but at least we should try to understand what they are aiming at and, and try to figure out uh, what the problems are. And the basic argument I'm making is um, the nuclear deterrent and the nuclearization of North Korea is their, in, in their thinking, their solution. And that is our problem. And the problem and the solution are, you know, in a sense, um, uh, matching with each other. Our problem is their solution. So it's very difficult to solve it. But uh, I think, as um, uh, Professor Dao said, we think uh, we have some solution, and the solution could be brought about uh, by building confidence, which is, of course, very difficult. But there are ways to build confidence. And the root cause is, as we have discussed uh, since yesterday, is mistrust among the countries concerned. And the mistrust is very, very deep. And, 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 and that is why the, the only helpful, reliable solution for, the, for their survival was and is uh, nuclearization. But uh, that is not the solution for the countries and the people in the world. So I'm trying to anyway uh, to try to figure out what the current regime is uh, trying and, and the reason why they are doing that. Um, the current crisis is, as uh, uh, Professor Zhao said, the, the, uh, the solu uh, consequences of successive failure of diplomacies by the surrounding countries. Um, expectations or wishful thinking of collapse, collapse of North Korean regime might have been the reason why the United States and its allies oscillation uh, between negotiation and neglect and threatening. The country is faced to create a solid common ground to face with North Korean uh, of Kim Jong-il. Uh, but at that time, when the Kim Jong-il was in power, we, I think we had chances to talk uh, with him and talk him down, uh, get out of uh, nuclearization. But the current regime is uh, different. I think um, the Kim Jong-un Kim Jong -un is very much determined to go nuclear and have at least exist, achieve an existential uh, deterrent. Um, let's see. Um, The only way, as I told you, is to, to address their fear and the concerns of current regime of North Korea. The, the country has been suffering from the fear of destruction by the United States and its allies. Of course, we are not trying to you know, destroy them with um, uh, military power, but they have been fearing about their collapse. And um, they have been learning uh, from the former uh, the experiences of other countries uh, like Iraq or Libya. Uh, Iraq had to try to develop nuclear weapons but lost capability. And after all, Saddam government was thrown away by the United States. 
The Libya abandoned the quite developed nuclear weapon program in expectation of uh, finding a stable position in the international community. Uh, but after all, the West opted for regime change. So um, for North Koreans, I think there shouldn't be any trust in the words of the West. So what they can rely upon is, uh, I think, uh, the nuclear weapons on, and the deterrent. So, so th that is why I'm saying that their solution um, is that, and our problem is that. So it is very difficult to get out of this um, uh, situation, but uh, the only way is, of course, uh, negative security assurances. But as I told you, words, promises, cannot be persuasive uh, for North Korean regime. So how can we create some kind of uh, credibility in, in each other? The one hope, I think, is we, the country is concerned in Northeast Asia, is, I think, basically the status quo countries. No, they are not really interested in changing the status quo. Uh, but the mutual mistrust is driving uh, most of the country into the arms race. And, and that is what we call the security dilemma. And we are in the security dilemma with a status quo orientation. So how do we um, try, make a, a build a trust among ourselves that the status could be kept without uh, threatening each other? It's very difficult, uh, but first we have to recognize that we are all status quo power, not the challenger to the status quo. And we have to recognize North Korea as it is, and, it, and um, as uh, the previous speakers uh, told you, that we have to talk with them and, and recognize North Korea as, uh, as, it, as it is although we may not be able to accept as a nuclear as a nuclear weapon power. Um, the thing is, but the, the um, difficulty lies in, in the um, uh, confidence building measures. And I think it's not very easy to, to build the confidence among ourselves. The one reason is the um, North Korean is, uh, their stake is uh, national security and regime security. For other countries uh, like United States or Japan, these two are different. Uh, but for North Korea, regime security and national security are the same. And, and uh, for ordinary confidence building is it to work, um, there should be transparency. Uh, but for North Koreans, the transparency is um, liability rather than merit. And by keeping the secret, uh, they are trying to uh, keep their security. So it's not quite easy to rely upon the uh, existing measures of confidence building. Uh, so far, I think I can say that, but we have to be patient and we have to build uh, confidence little by little. And the first step is to start talking. Um, and start talking uh, from the side of the United States and, and without threatening. And that is very difficult to, for American people, for Japanese public to accept. But uh, in order to start the talk, we have to stop threatening the North Korean regime. And that is, I think, only the only the way to going to the stable um, solution. And, and the solution would probably have to be part of the build, uh, part of the uh, regional security uh, framework. And, and there were uh, once uh, six party talks, and I think there, that was the only hope. And, and although North Korean regime is saying that it's not, it's dead, that six party talk is dead. But um, we have to recreate six-party six talks, and that should be the uh, starting point for building the regional security framework. 
with, I think, one or two minutes left for me, uh, <laughs> I think I should talk about the Japanese reaction to the current situation. There is no big public debate uh, about how to react to the nuclear in North Korea in Japan. Uh, most of the public are uh, bewildered and public, and, and, um, but, I'm not sh but I'm sure the type of argument like mine let's stop threatening and start talking, is not popular among Japanese public. Um, the government of Japan is increasing the level of the U.S.-Japan military cooperation on the defense budget, and that is their only way to cope with North Korea. And I think that is not working, and that will not work. But the, the government is relying upon the military threat. Um, I think it's not working. Uh, on the other hand, there always have been people advocating Japanese nuclear armament. That people are very, very limited, and the public are not uh, persuaded by those people. But it is worrisome that the people, uh, for people like me, that the public are more and more accepting the idea of the, the threat, and the military threat could be the only way out. So, um, that is on the, uh, the opposite to my idea. So, um, I do think that Japan should not trap the inter-security dilemma and it should not worsen, deteriorate the security dilemma which is already uh, deep enough. Um, base of basic discourse of security in Japan should be uh, strengthened and that is uh, the way I think Japan should contribute, it, contribute it to the uh, betterment of the current situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I think that's a very good uh, presentation. Uh, now, could I ask uh, uh, Dr. Makshu 10 minutes presentation? Good morning, and thank you very much, Dr. General Pan for your kind introduction. As he mentioned, indeed, I'm the only Korean who is actually visiting North Korea often and then have a consultation with the leadership for the last 20 years. So I should say a few words about what North Korea is I and mean, the regime. It functions very differently. It believes that they are waging a war which the grandfather of the current leader, Kim Il-sung, started in 1950. And they think the war is going on. We have forgotten already. South Korea thought the Korean War was long ago, six years ago. But North Korea is everyday life. So when you visit the country, it's a curfew at 10 o'clock. So you have to turn off the light because they are afraid that U.S. Army will invade again and bomb the whole country because North Korea was flattened. And when 1952, during the war, President Truman authorized eight pieces of nuclear bombs to use against North Korea. But General MacArthur couldn't find any target anymore. They were already flattened. So General MacArthur was planning to use them against North, Northern China. So Truman was horrified because that will be beginning of the Third World War. So he fired General MacArthur and luckily North Koreans survived. So the paranoid attitude of North Korea against nuclear weapons is based on experiences during the Korean War. And they are still at war and whole society is under control of the military. People cannot move from one place to another place. So only limitation of their movement per person is 40 kilometers if you walk you can reach maybe 40 kilometers per day. That's why that's a limitation. And if you want to move to one place to another, you have to get permission. So it's like the whole current country is organized like a prison. So I see, it, I mean, 25 million North Koreans are more like a hostage of the regime. And then expecting, I mean, by using the sanctions against the regime, expecting any change or collapse is illusion. It's impossible, even if the people, because people cannot move. More than three people cannot get together. This is, 
it's very tragic. I mean, I'm a foreigner. They treat me as a guest. So I'm much freer than North Korean. Maybe perhaps Kim Jong-un will be free. He can do whatever. I mean, he's the only one who has access to the Internet. He knows what's going on outside of the world. But the rest of the population, 25 million people, cannot. So do not expect that only sanctions or any other means can bring about changes within North Korea. So I think the main task of the U.S. or South Korea is tell the North Korean leader the North Korean war is over. Nobody wants to resume the fighting again because neither North Korea or U.S. wants to have any military means to be applied because that will be, as Ambassador mentioned, will be a disaster for the whole Korean people will be dead. That's why I think the first, in a way, objective should be how to terminate the Korean War peacefully. And, okay, North Korean leaders always demand they need a peace treaty from the U.S. Peace treaty was, I mean, promised many times but never kept because the U.S. Congress is objecting any deal with North Korea because, I mean, the North Korea, China, and the U.S. signed the truce agreement in 53 and promising that peace mechanism will be sought and then agreed upon later on. But until today, there is no chance of any peace treaty being offered. All, all the six party talks and other forums they were discussed, but still U.S. is not willing to offer anything or not willing to accept North Korea because it's a wartime enemy. But without ending the Korean War, I don't see any chance that the nuclear issues can be solved peacefully. But uh, the real root cause of the problem is there's are two Koreas. South Korea and North Korea exist on the Korean Peninsula. And they became full members of the United Nations in September 91. So the whole world recognizes there are two Koreas on the Korean Peninsula. But only U.S. and Japan refuse to recognize North Korea as a sovereign state. So North Korea still thinks U.S. should recognize them as a sovereign state. That's one demand. And Japan also refused to recognize North Korea. Past I mean, negotiations failed. But the real problem is between two Koreas. They refuse to recognize each other as a sovereign state, and North Korea views South Korea as a colony of the U.S. They think they should continue their revolution and then liberate South Korea, southern part. And then South Korea at the same time, they see North Korea as illegally occupying South Korean territory. So Constitution of South Korea defines territory of South Korea as a whole peninsula. So it's almost impossible that South Korean government can recognize North Korea as a sovereign state. So it's a root cause of the Korean problem is undefined the relations between two Koreas. And then uh, one positive maybe aspect or hope is at least since May this year, the new president, Moon Jae-in, he is a son of a North Korean refugee. And they were saved, I mean, two people from North Korea, the parents of Moon Jae-in, were evacuated by the U.S. Army in 1953. Soon after the actual signing of the truce agreement, they were escaped from North Korea, and then and the president was born in South Korea in a refugee camp. So he's determined, in a way, to change the situation in Korea. But he is confronting enormous resistance from South Korean conservatives that North Korea they should be destroyed, not to be recognized. So that's a real problem, but I think the, for the sake of the world peace or international peace, the, I think U.S. as an ally, strong ally of the South Korea, should persuade South Korea. Instead of seeking a unification policy, just recognize North Korea as it is and then try to normalize relations and then find a peaceful solution. And then China, or the strong ally of North Korea, should persuade North Korea. Just forget about the unification strategy of North Korea and changing South Korea into communist regime. It's unrealistic and illusionary. So I think U.S. and China 
should persuade two Koreas and then try to accommodate with each other and then find a solution. I mean, it's a very, very difficult task, but I think that will be possible and, and also cheap because any military means against North Korea is impossible because the whole North Korea has fourth largest army in the world. 1.5 million people are under arms and then about 3 million reserves. So it's a whole society is armed and they're ready to fight, I mean, to protect. That's why I think many people view North Korean nuclear weapons and missiles are the real danger. But I think, to me, the real danger of North Korea is a nationalism. The 25 million people are forced by the leader, wrong leader, to fight against, I mean, the rest of the world. Uh, how can you go about it? It wouldn't work because they, they are forced to follow the leader and the leader believes that he's only 33 years old. He inherited his, the, the power from his father five years ago. So he's bluffing, I mean, he's, he knows that U.S. Will not do, cannot do anything because if US, North Korea is attacked by the U.S., China and uh, Russia will rescue them as, I mean, during the Korean War. So young leader, Kim Jong-un, he knows very well that he can bluff. He can pretend that now he owns hydrogen bomb and, and all kind of I mean, ICBMs and we can really threaten the continental U.S. But hoping that U.S. will get into talk with him. And he's sending messages to President Trump. Only thing Trump needs to do is call him and then make a deal. So it's, it's, a, it's a very tragic situation that a wrong leader is keeping the whole population in hostage and then tr trying to make a gamble actually with the U.S. So it's a very tragic situation, but at least in South Korea at the moment, Mark. yeah, okay, okay, one second. South Korea for the first time promised that will not seek unification and will not seek a policy of a regime change in North Korea. That's a big step, maybe turn around over South Korean policy in the last 10 years. But now North Korea don't trust him. So he has to prove that uh, it's, uh, it's means serious. So the situation in Korea is very sad. Very situation is, I mean, hopeless, but not that bad. I think once we can find a political solution and we can solve it very easily. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I think your presentation serves as a reminder that North Korea's nuclear issue is not just sim sim as simple as a non-proliferation issue. I think it is embedded in a very complex and long-term kind of uh, regional security uh, situation. And that's why many people advocated that solution of the nuclear issue of North Korea would have to go hand in hand with preparing a more propitious regional security situation. Uh, so this, uh, this is a very important. Now, would I, I would like to invite Sharon to give a very brief comment uh, on uh, what uh, has been talking about. Thank you very much. Um, just briefly on the presentations, I, I believe, Tong, you outlined very, four very critical questions. I'm not so sure that we are that, that the U.S. is that far apart from China um, even though, mostly because reality will set in at some point when the Trump administration realizes that its policy is not going to work. Um, I'd like to just provide a few caveats. Um, I'm going to give kind of a U.S., a little bit of a U.S. perspective, but I have no particular insider information and I'm just uh, speaking as an interested onlooker. I'd like to raise three questions that I think we should think about. 
Are North Korea's nuclear weapons an important issue for the Trump administration? You could argue it two ways. One is yes, Trump has an interest in things nuclear. That could be good or bad. Um, and Kim Jong-un has made it difficult for him to ignore uh, this. But we actually, there is a policy, strangely enough, and, and that's um, a remarkable achievement for this particular administration. That policy is maximum pressure and engagement, um, and I like to joke that it's maximum pressure on North Korea and engagement with the Chinese. And <laughs> there is one very funny uh, uh, thing recently the State Department asked for proposals uh, from people to how to implement that maximum pressure um, policy and there was a small line that said, and oh, by the way, none of this money can be used to engage the North Koreans. So, uh, but I think there's hope. Uh, and I think one, one of the, the hope for engagement is uh, that the North Koreans are interested in revitalizing the New York back channel and that there are track to, you know, we have met with North Koreans on the margins of uh, particular conferences. Um, so yes, it's important, but no, Trump is not a president who has a strategic vision or cares very much about things that don't reflect back on him. And there is the possibility that he could blunder into war, not because it would serve any strategic purpose, but because he could blunder. <laughs> so <clears throat> whose views in the administration count? Well, obviously, Trump's views do, and his rhetoric is frankly frightening. Between fire and fury, locked and loaded, uh, you know, but on the other hand, he's also tweeted out that Kim Jong-un, for example, on August 16th, made a very wise and well-reasoned decision. There's the possibility that he could actually <laughs> have a dialogue with Kim Jong-un. Um, there's Mike Pompeo, head of the CIA, who said North Korea, uh, a North Korean attack is not imminent. That's good. There's Steve Bannon, who was somewhat reasonable, but he got fired. Uh, there's Rex Tillerson, as Secretary of State. He has a big role to play, but you know his uh, value in the administration is a little unclear. However, he has done some positive things. The four no's, right? No col uh, regime collapse no um, accelerated reunification, we're not gonna send our troops north. And then there are military um, voices. H.R. McMaster says, Kim Jong-un can't be deterred. I submit that's not a policy, that's a belief. Other uh, military officials who are actually in charge of the military have been more positive, right? So PACOM commander has said, uh, Harry Harris has said diplomacy and economic action first, military force is just a backup, um, and uh, Mr. Dunford has said diplomacy and sanctions, who's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and then military force. So I know I'm going on, but um, recently we had uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis and Secretary of State Tillerson write an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal on North Korea policy, and they said it's not strategic patience, it's strategic accountability. It's very rare to have a Secretary of State and Defense write an op-ed like that. In recent history, we've only had one on the New START Treaty and one on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So that in itself is an indication people are paying attention. On the other hand, the message was mixed. <laughs> there was a lot of language that was what I would call old think, right? Denuclearization is right up front. Um, there were a lot of trigger words. They used the term illegal. Uh, they said, you know, tensions are at a level not experienced since the Korean War. And they said the DP, uh, North Korea should take certain actions as a prerequisite to demonstrate their sincerity. But there was nothing they said that the US was going to do, or, or you know, not a matching set of actions. So, 
also that was it had multiple audiences. There was a lot in that op-ed directed at China. I'm very sympathetic to your your um, analysis that China believes we don't really have a policy because we're not that specific. I'm hoping that the learning curve for this administration, it, that they move up it quickly uh, because we don't have much time if we want to seize the opportunity uh, to actually talk to the North Koreans. Bottom line uh, for me is the advice to onlookers, don't panic, turn off Twitter. <laughs> um, unlike the 2003 invasion of Iraq, where there were people actively working in the U.S. government to come up with reasons to go to war in Iraq, I would suggest that the correlation of forces, to use an old Soviet term, dictates avoiding war on the Korean Peninsula. And I think that the actions by North Korea so far are not tipping the balance toward making war necessary or desirable. My advice to the White House is engage in talks about talks. Do not set, yes, we, everyone wants North Korea to stop missile tests and nuclear tests, but be a little flexible. You know, it's really the, the strongest person in the room who has the, the, the flexibility to be flexible, right? And so that's a tough, um, tough advice for Mr. Trump to take, but there are other people in his administration who might understand that. Thank you. Very, very good comment. Well, I cannot help uh, thinking that uh, if I want to make use of the privilege as a moderator to provide just a couple of carriage for the discussion of, uh, of the issue, uh, just please allow me just to use a few minutes uh, to, to provide you a couple of points I think that might be pertinent to our discussion. The first point I want to make is the topic of our workshop today is supposed to talk on Northeast Asia security. But what we have been hearing is all about North Korea. But my message to you is Northeast Asia security is not all about North Korea. There are other security issues in my perspective, it will be as much important, or if not more important, than North Korea's issue in this region, which might have strong impact on the shaping of security architecture, architecture in Northeast Asia in the future. And I happen to think, uh, first of all, this region has been witnessing a power restructuring unprecedented, perhaps ever since the end of the Cold War. We see amid this uh, power restructuring a rising major power competition. Major players in this region have been all out to try to make out some new strategy of perception, new strategy, and new deployment of their forces. I think that this kind of uh, major power competition serves as a larger context. The other nuclear and other security issues emerge, including North Korea nuclear issue. Sometimes I wonder this nuclear issue in Peninsula is not just used as a part of the game of major power competition. So I think that uh, that not only has added complexity to North Korea's nuclear issue, this power competition also gives 
North Korea a lot of room for maneuver and makes more defined you see, to the international community because it believes it could make use of major power competition to, to play one major power against the other. So I think that unless there is a better understanding among these major players in this region, North Korea's nuclear issue would be very, very difficult to resolve. Simply because all the other countries have a different threat perceptions, different security calculations, and the divergent security interests as they perceive. So, think that way. As I said, that the North Korea issue is not just as simple as a non-proliferation issue there. Not as simple as if North Korea said it would abandon nuclear programs and everything will be okay. So this is the first point. Second point is, we are all talking about the challenges, risks, dangers in Northeast Asia, particularly on, North, on the peninsula. But my view is, North East Asia has also witnessed great opportunities for peace and security. Ever since the end of the Korean War in 1953, this region has witnessed unrare, actually, peace and stability. If you look at other parts of the world, I can assure you, Northeast Asia still, up to today, one of the most safe places in the world. And there is a, such a kind of a economic boom, economic dynamics in the region that serves as a kind of a strong incentive for economic interdependence, economic cooperation. I think that serves as a Stray a great kind of uh, constraining factor, you see, for any military conflict imaginable, even on the peninsula. So I, I still am quite optimistic. If at all is resumed, I think that the people here in this region have uh, wisdom to see how to get the way out, or at least to contain the dangers. Don't let our fear become a self-fulfilled prophecy. I think that uh, the challenge for us is not to see to, or to calculate how the war will break out. I think that the challenge is how these major players could really work in good faith together to maintain continuing stability of this region. Okay, uh, these are uh, my, the points I, I want to make. Uh, now still have uh, uh, 20 minutes uh, for our uh, questions. Uh, could I ask uh, our Russian colleague first? <laughs> Please ask questions and make very short comments. Again, we cannot afford to have a long presentation. Uh, thank you. I'd like uh, to follow a bit from uh, where General Pan, Mr. Chairman, you stopped. Uh, we, we have intellectually a very challenging situation with so many different components. The problem is that linear logic and linear political logic would not work. And we are seeing too much of linear way of thinking in different way by different players on sorry on the basis i didn't mean you uh, on, on the basis of different let's say own strategic objectives one of the important things now i will submit is really to begin to engagement and i don't think that engagement can be begun by simply 
pressuring or hitting on the head of China, so that China hits on the head of uh, North Korea, and North Korea goes and sits with the United States. You know, in this situation, such things cannot work, in my view. And even a very positive and a little bit overdue uh, Chinese-Russian proposal on double freeze cannot, and it was pointed, become the subject immediately. You have to have pre-negotiations. You have to have pre-dance. And somebody uh, should uh, probably take the initiative. The problem is that traditional uh, members of six-party talks, uh, apart from North Korea, I don't think that either of them can really take the initiative. That's why I liked what Gleb said about the UN. That has to be explored. Maybe we can also explore possible role of Kazakhstan, by the way, because they did play an interesting role, very positive role, uh, at the early stage of pre-negotiations uh, uh, of P5 plus 1 and, the, and uh, Iran, which resulted eventually in GCPOA. Uh, so one has to be imaginative uh, and not to fix the agenda too much. The important thing is to create a platform and then see uh, whether different sub-platforms ca can be created. But at the end of the day, I think it is important that OP5 take uh, a responsible role in this game because I think that at least part of the solutions developed at the end would have to go through the Security Council and, and adopt it. And finally, another appeal to think tanks and wonk tanks around the world and the, in, in the US perhaps in particular. Don't hype the threats uh, because otherwise not only people would uh, be misled, but also government officials, and not just in the U.S., would be misled. Thank you. Yes. Uh, General, may I ask two questions? Uh, please identify yourself. Yes, my name is Peter Jenkins. I'm chairman of British Pugwash. Um, first, is it possible that the North Korean leadership sees an interest in perpetuating the illusion that North Korea is still at war and has no interest in detente because that illusion facilitates maintaining a stranglehold over 25 million North Korean subjects. Um, and secondly, is there any evidence that it's a long-term objective of the North Korean leadership to decouple the United States from South Korea? Thank you. Could I, could I suggest this? Uh, because we don't have much time, in fact, and therefore I cannot ask uh, individual speaker to respond to individual questions. Uh, and therefore, I would collect a few more questions, and, uh, and then I will ask uh, our speakers each will speak just about two or three minutes to respond. Uh, that way, I think that we could encourage more questions or comments from the audience. So if that is agreeable, uh, yeah, it's it works. Yeah. Very briefly, Reza from CTBTO. I totally subscribe to the proposal that one should start, I mean, as the Chinese famous proverb goes, uh, a journey of miles stop, uh, starts with the first step. Yeah? Okay. The journey of miles starts with the first step. I believe that uh, having talks for the sake of talk is, is, is a very, very advisable start. You have to build trust gradually. I mean, the, the tensions are very high. You have to, do, to try to calm the situation and it starts a line of communication. You don't uh, expect that people would immediately, as you're threatening them, would come and say, okay, we capitulate and whatever you want. I mean, 
the end result of negotiation, which is denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, cannot happen at the beginning of the negotiations as a, as a precondition or so, or, or the DPRK renouncing its nuclear program. That should be the end result of, of the negotiations, not a precondition for, for negotiations. And we believe CTVTO is, is a platform for this freeze for freeze. And I want to see how much that would be possible that you would go for freeze for freeze and the possibility of DPRK accepting CTB, signing CTBT. Thank you. Okay. I want to ask the lady just in at the back. Yeah. Uh, thank no, you. No, the lady. Thank you. My, I'm Salma Shine from King's College London. So my, uh, I have just two uh, quick questions to Tong. I want your opinion on two things. One is about the role of EU uh, in dealing with NK, uh, North Korea's issue. Because there have been proposals in academia that you know, the EU can play an important role as a, maybe a, as a mediator or a facilitator in, this, uh, in dealing with this issue, or at least starting uh, some dialogues between the uh, different parties. And my second question is about, in terms of priority, uh, what is more important for Chinese officials? Is it stability of North Korea or is it denuclearization of North Korea? Thank you. Yes, this one. Uh, thank you, Alan. We're parliamentarians for nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. I have a question of Mr. Endo. Uh, what do you think about the possibilities that have been opened up from the Japanese side with the appointment by, by Prime Minister Abe of Taro Kono as the new foreign minister, knowing that he supports the Northeast Asian nuclear weapon-free zone, he's got dialogue with Koreans, has a Korean website. Does that open up possibilities from the Japanese side? Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Michiel Hoogveen. I'm from the Netherlands. I've been to North Korea three times now in the last four years. Um, and what I've learned there is that the word reform is a dirty word for North Koreans. That means what the leader says or what the, le what the leader has said is the truth and nothing but the truth. He has said publicly that he's working on his Byungjin line, which means parallel development of nuclear weapons and economic development. Don't you believe it is impossible in this narrative that North Korea will denuclearize at all? Thank you. Tom, uh, Thomas Jonter, Swedish Pagwish. Um, <laughs> I was pleased to hear that Sharon Skwasoni think it's possible that Tong Shao's analysis could be bought by hopefully, potentially, by the Trump uh, administration. That would be good, because I think it's much of what you said, much truth in what you said. But I was not so convinced with your outlook. Maybe I misunderstood you. You talked about uh, to integrate North Korea after some kind of uh, freeze the nuclear weapons program in North Korea at the current status, and to have uh, them integrated. In, in the world affairs to initiate reforms. Is that realistic? Could you give us more flesh on the bone? Because I think that's key here, to after some kind of action, after some kinds of first agreements, what will happen then? Otherwise, I mean, as Mr. Mark Su argued, it's like a prison there. Why should we expect reforms to take place? To if, if it's just a survival of the power elite. Thank you. Thank you, General Pan. Uh, clearly, there were two kinds of tracks. Uh, my name is Rakesh Sood from India. There were two tracks. One was the track, the nuclear track on which some of the speakers focused, but then Clearly, there are limits as to how far that focusing exclusively on the nuclear track would go. Uh, so 
I, my question is more to Mark, who came out with a much more, he reversed it in terms of the politics of it and said, let's make a beginning with recognition. And I, if I understood you correctly, you said that it is US and South Korea are the two countries which do not recognize North Korea. And so if that is achieved, then that carries with itself the biggest assurance to the North Korean regime. Now, my question to you is, uh, on that, on that political thing, wh where do you find the biggest obstacles? I mean, considering that uh, you now have a president in South Korea who should be more positively inclined, and does that tie in with the chairman, General Pan's hypothesis that it is the large power mistrust, namely US, China, and others, which prevents that kind of a political opening from happening, and therefore we keep focusing exclusively on the nuclear track. Good. Uh, one workshop cannot exhaust all the questions and the concerns. So I would like to complete this uh, the question raising and ask our speakers to respond uh, just uh, in a couple of minutes each. So Mark, uh, you might have a first of all the response. Okay, thank you. Uh, there were a few questions that I should respond quickly. Anyway, from Jenkins from Great Britain asking that the long-term objective of North Korean leader, whether it's uh, withdrawal of the U.S. forces, definitely, yes. Not long term, but almost short term. They want to push out the U.S. forces from South Korea as soon as possible. That, they think having nuclear option, things will work out very quickly. That is a wrong perception of North Korean leader that having capability of reaching U.S. or threatening U.S. directly will force eventually U.S. forces out of South Korea. This is a real danger at the moment. And then also Sergei was proposing that Kazakhstan could play a role as a mediating. Uh, it's a very bad idea because the problem was when North Korea wanted to send a delegation to this conference, four people, some way Kazakh government was very uncooperative, so they couldn't come. So I think North Koreans wouldn't accept. At the moment, they are accepting mediation or some kind of cooperation only through Pugwash and then also Vietnam and Mongolia. Very few countries are reliable, or at least they, they, they think they trust as a friends, but not so many of them. But anyway, the also comment from Indian colleague, the recognition, political recognition of North Korea by South Korea and the U.S. Uh, most key issue, important. But the, there are so many obstacles actually built in within the South Korean system. For example, constitution defines the whole territory of South Korea, including North Korea. That's why North Koreans are bandits occupying illegally South Korean territory. So they have to push out, not recognize them or reward them as the uh, sovereign state, but they think regime change should come first. That's uh, one of the obstacles. But in addition to that, U.S. is strongly against any direct dialogue between North and South Korea. That's why U.S. is assuring or giving the extended deterrence to South Korea, and then they think uh, cooperation should be strengthened in security in measures between Japan and South Korea, and the U.S. should work together, but not just have a dialogue between two Koreas. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, as for the visit by the Japanese Prime Minister or, or Foreign Minister to North Korea, I think it will not be coming uh, soon, and it may be uh, counterproductive to current situation. Um, domestically, the political situ situation in Japan is not favorable for you know the um, Prime Minister or Foreign Minister to go to uh, North Korea. And internationally, I think that the countries around North Korea should take coordinated action. And, uh, and um, unilateral independent action by Japanese government would not be, you know, uh, 
uh, creating a favorable condition for the negotiation, I think. Uh, but on the other hand, um, the uh, threats from, uh, from North Korea uh, or security concern uh, created by the threats of North Korean nuclearization is uh, actually good for Prime Minister Abe for his own domestic uh, conservative political agenda. He'd like to create um, a stronger uh, safe defense force and he'd like to change uh, Japan's so-called peace constitution. And North Korea is giving the leverage for him, so I'm not sure whether it's a um, uh, critical point for him uh, or not, but I think uh, his visit will not be coming. But oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, to, to part to answer the question from the gentleman from City Vito, I think even for a simple freeze agreement, it, it has to be a phased agreement. We, given the lack of um, trust, we have to start with easy steps, such as stopping missile tests, which does not require on-site verification, and is you know is reversible. If you believe the other side is cheating, you can quickly resume what you are doing before. It has low uh, political cost, and if some trust is built during that process, maybe we can move on to more difficult steps, such as freezing the production of more uh, missiles, freezing the production of fissile materials. But still, I think inspection is going to be hard, given that North Korea cannot decide for now that it is going to denuclearize in the future. Inviting inspectors will only reveal vulnerability of its program. So I don't think that's a possibility at this moment. Secondly, the role of EU. I think EU has already played an important role. There are you know, diplomatic call in North Korea from EU. Earlier this year, EU expressed uh, interest to be more uh, deeply involved in addressing North Korean uh, crisis. Um, some, you know, some other roles that EU can play is to firstly provide a better and deeper understanding about North Korean internal politic politics and internal thinking on the leadership by being able to uh, 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 be present in, in North Korea and also to continue providing you know, all the training programs, joint environmental uh, projects, uh, joint clean energy projects to introduce the North Korean elites to the outside world. Uh, I think that has long-term role. But at, in, at the end of the day, given that uh, U.S. still is the primary actor that creates the threat perception in North Korea, I think uh, it's still important for EU to persuade the U.S. Uh, uh, to be more flexible in, in its dealing with North Korea. Ambassador? A very short remark. Uh, yesterday, I remember uh, an Israeli colleague uh, said uh, that people fight each other not because they have arms. And he related to the case of Cain and others. Because there are certain differences of opinion, there is certain rivalry. And I think the way to settle the Korean issue is normalization of inter-Korean relations. The colleague answered whether the DPRK still feels itself at war with South Korea. But how can it be uh, indifferent? Because this armistice agreement was just an agreement between commanders of uh, military forces which participated in the Korean War. There is no peace treaty, and formally, the DPRK and the Republic of Korea are still at war with each other. So there should be normalization of inter-Korean relation and the former uh, administration of Nomu Han and Kim De Jun, they offered a very practical settlement, this economic integration of two Koreas. They thought that within 15 or 20 years there would be economic integration, they would, that would automatically lead to political integration. Unfortunately, there are certain outside forces uh, which uh, make uh, different uh, impediments to that. But anyway, the core of the problem is non-normal state of inter-Korean relations. When we uh, fix a settlement of that problem of the Korean issue as such, we will uh, f uh, look, uh, we will be able to find the settlement of nuclear problem as well. 
Now, since there is almost a consensus that one of the most important factors to impact on the progress of uh, the nuclear issue on the peninsula is a very, very unpredictable policy of uh, Trump administration. Uh, Sharon, do you have any thoughts to offer on whether there is a possibility of a resumption of uh, dialogue and uh, steps towards peaceful resolution on the part of the United States? Just a, a couple of minutes. I think Rex Tillerson <clears throat> has said, I mean, he, he is going out of his way to praise the North Koreans for the tiniest little bit of restraint, right? Oh, gee, they haven't tested, well, okay, they tested this morning or whenever. Uh, <laughs> short range, though, short range. <laughs> um, we, it's very hard to uh, say whether there's a possibility. I do think that military officials are likely advising Mr. Trump that he doesn't want to get into a war. Um, I would hope that they would say, look, talk, talk for talk's sake, that you don't lose anything by doing that. It's not so, you know, when we had the Bush years and we had the rogue, I forget what phrase he used, rogue states, right? There's less ideology, oddly enough, under the Trump administration than in previous um, governments. So that gives me a tiny glimmer of hope um, as long as we don't look at Twitter too often. <laughs> could, could I ma just make one comment about um, the, the person in the back mentioned, you know, de denuclearization, uh, is this, are we ever going to get there? North Korean officials said to me on the margins, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll do denuclearization when we have a world free of nuclear weapons. That's great, right? We'll all go down that path together. But, you know, maybe we approach their denuclearization in the same way that we approach a world free of nuclear weapons, which is you hold it out as a goal and you work steadily on stripping away the things that are most dangerous. There are a lot of risks in that approach, right? But do we have any option? No. So the other, th one last point. We, we seem, I, I do kind of feel like we're living in a bubble, right? North Korea tested weapons in 2006. They have nuclear weapons. So all of this tension now is because there are some, you know, media and, and people in the Trump administration who are afraid that there might be an ICBM launched at us. That is hype. That is truly hype. And so we need to sit back and, you know, it would be great if Ivanka Trump could put on her Christmas wish list peace on the Korean Peninsula. Maybe we might then get a, a you know, a strategic vision. There, a lot has to happen for the Trump administration to pursue a real approach that has a, a, a well-developed policy. And Kim Jong-un also has to play along. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think that it was uh, that we could conclude our discussion. I want to apologize to the speakers for my rude way to limit your freedom of expression uh, in a very limited uh, period of time. And also, I thank you, the audience, uh, uh, kind of patience uh, for this. So thank you very much uh, for all this uh, storm sharing. The session is concluded.